All right, Fabrizio, take it away. Okay, yeah, today I would like to talk about the installers. So I think many people just know one or, or maybe two of them. Uh, first, I would like to start, give an introduction about our team. So uh, the installer team is composed by Brian, Dennis, myself. So I forgot to introduce myself. Well, my name is Fabricio, and I'm from Pulp Team, and I work at the, the Pulp Staller Team and the CI Team. Uh, Matthias and Mike, would you like to introduce yourselves? We can skip that part. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Yeah, the, the easy way to reach us is through IRC on Freenode at Pulp and Pulp Dev channel and at the mailing lists at Pulp List and Pulp Dev. So I think the, the most usable installer is the Pulp Starter. It is a collection at Galaxy. Uh, we can install pulp from PyPI, RPM, or even local repos, which we use for dev environment. And we have a, doc a doc documentation at the read the docs. I can open it here. So it describes every hole that, that we use with the variables and that is pretty of useful information there. And about that, I would like to talk about some concepts that uh, we have like roles, that are individual role, like for starting a web server or something very specific like Pulp API. And we have a prerequisite roles that is the roles that are prerequisite for a specific plugin. So far, we just have it for RPM. And we have the meta roles that it is a set of roles that installs poop. So we can gather some roles under the poop service like poop API, poop web service, and so on. And we have poop lift. It's not exactly an installer, it, but we use it for dev environment. It makes use of Pulp Staller to get a, a vagrant environment set up. And we have just, for documentation, we just have the readme at the repository. And we have now single container Im images. We majorly use it for the CI. And the only documentation we have for it so far is at the bookproject.org. So here we provide a few steps to get the, the to build the, the container. And the last is the pulp operator. So we have an uh, operator for pulp tree and we start our documentation at read the docs. And we are planning to to work more on pool operator on the next term. And I think that the, the major problem that we have so far is about documentation because we, each installer provides its own documentation, but we have mentions about the, the installer at the pool core and at the plugins, like you can see here. So, Pulp Core provides a 
few notes on some inst installations like the recommended one that uses Pulp Installer, some PyPI, and a bunch of plugins do the same. So it is easy to get outdated and it's hard to keep up because uh, whenever you make some change at a poop starter, you would m maybe have to change on every plugin. So that, that, that starts my first question about how can we improve the user experience with the installers because we have multiple docs everywhere and we don't know, maybe a user come just for use poop RPM and the first reference for installer that he or she will get, you'll be the documentation for listed on poop RPM plugin that may be or not outdated. So I would like to talk about uh, the ideas, suggestions for we improve our documentation. Yeah, so, I mean, I think the main thing I'm hearing here is that we need one place where we talk about the installer and that all plugins reference that one place and not have any sort of um, examples of their own because those examples are always going to be out of date. It doesn't matter if we updated it today, tomorrow it's going to be out of date. <laughs> oh. And <clears throat> we already kind of, we've started providing some document. We have only made this worse. Um, we have the read the doc site for the installer itself, which is great. Um, but we also have some information in pulp cores documentation and, um, I think we need to, uh, combine all of this into one place and with our effort to publish all the docs on docs.pulpproject.org, I think we're going to have an opportunity to put it all on that one website and it'll probably be under the pulp core name or perhaps it can have its own URL um, pulp installer there, but everything should link to there. And Dennis, along with what you're saying, just to share it, um, part of the docs goal that you just identified is to have a unified browsing experience um, uh, to deduplicate the docs between what are currently different independent sites and to try to allow a single left navigation or some sort of navigation to um, allow you to move to the different areas, what are now different sites to be one site. So the installer would be one major section of there. And to the point about deduplication, we would de be deduplicating what we now spread across two different sites. Um, and another point about uh, deduplication is the quick start guides. Um, right now, most of the plugins contain an, an installer config, like use this config with the installer and you'll get the installed plugin. And what would be great is if the installer section maybe would have that in it. Perhaps that's the right way to organize it. Perhaps the art plugins themselves still should have it, but there should be one place versus what we do now. Um, Fabricio, just what you went over right now, I feel like the even coming someone coming to the website um, and looking through all of the different options that we're giving them, even before they get to the docs, um, I can see that someone needs that what you just did basically, but you know, in a, in a, in a, they don't have to watch a video to find it, but 
you know, I want to go install pulp. Um, and um, I don't even know which one to start with. Like, there's so many options and I don't even know, you know, and they know, but they just say, I want to install pulp. That's all they know. Um, so, but for them, it's almost like we need to give them some questions. Like, are you trying to do a dev environment? Um, are you just trying to check it out? Um, you know, do you require RPMs in your environment? Like just sort of giving them a little bit of that decision flow chart kind of thing that you um, kind of outlined there of like, this is why I want to go install pulp. Like, which one should I use? Because even before getting to the, like, how do I actually do run this installer? Like, there's this decision point and you just pointed out very nicely and illustrated like how many different options we give them. And a lot of them may be like, I really don't, I don't, I don't care. Like I just, <laughs> you know, like I just want to start. And, and this is, you know, what I think as far as like what I need and I just don't even know what to do here. So some sort of opinionated, like, you know, if you're doing this, go here, um, kind of a list of different ways that they can make their decision of which, which documentation do I even go look at? Um, I think it's definitely very well illus illustrated by the slides that you just presented to us. And maybe also um, writing down a paragraph for each type of installer, like what is the purpose for pulp installer? What is the purpose of pulp lift? Like if you plan to try it out and have some hands-on experience, this is the use case. So use this sort of installer. If you plan to set it up in production, better use other installer. Because yeah, Robin is right. Yeah. There are a lot of options and uh, you don't really understand which option is the best use case uh, for your situation. Yep. So I really like that we now have um, a drop down on our website for the different installation methods. In, in addition to that, I think we need to have like an installation landing page that provides that information. As Enid said, like for this use case, do this. For this other use case, do that. Um, and uh, then link to those pages. I mean, obviously we still wanna have them available in the menu, but just an additional installation page outlining the different use cases very briefly. You know, I think in calling back to the discussion we had yesterday, Monday, I'm sorry, this whole year blurs, um, about, the, about the switch we're going through between switching from how do we get more developer co contributors to how do we get and enlarge the user base? If we think of those as, our, as two big use cases, if, if, the, if the, I wanna, I wanna use pulp starts with two, use cases. The first one is what's the fastest way to get a pulp demo up and running and have a, you know, here's the three steps you follow and it'll get it up and running and you can play with it. Maybe even, sorry, I'm stop designing. The second one is I want to, I want to change pulp. I want to do development for pulp. And then there's advanced cases, which, which is where we get to split out into all the, I want to run it in this particular production environment, or I have to use RPMs or I love Ina's mask. Um, uh, that could be like a, I already know I'm an advanced user or I know what I'm doing, lead them off to somewhere else. But the main page separate into those two user communities that we've been talking about and, and just say, I'm not developing. I have no idea what you guys are about. Here's the fastest way to get it up and running. I am a developer. I want to help. Here's the fastest way to get you up and running. And then everything else is an advanced topic kind of thing. Um, how does that think? How does that sound to folk? Yeah, sounds good to me. I was thinking like something in the form of the, uh, frequently asked questions like, oh, I wanted to get it to run. How can I do it? And you just suggest, oh, go with container and so on. But going to the specifics of the documentation, uh, as we talked about pulp lift a couple days ago, I think maybe yesterday, like, let me share my screen. So, I think, let me go back to the pop lift. 
So Poplift has like they install it as a sub repo and all the major things you have on your environment are done through the installer. But many people don't know that. And let me see what is the installer docs. Here. So I thought that, no, that is, let me try to get the link here. Here. So when you talk about the development environment, the major things uh, we have on Poplift are here. And I thought that came up was about the aliases and we have it here. So we are failing to communicate uh, on installing procedures even with ourselves. So I think the Poplift has this challenge and I, I would like to talk a little bit more about it. What do you think, how can we facilitate the documentation of poop lift because poop lift is kind of a proxy for poop installer and i think many users don't don't know that yeah um first of all i think it's a good idea to have the documentation of the installer in the installer repo because with every change you can get the installation in the same version so I'm not sure whether this combined uh, browsing experience thing would be possible with taking documentation source from different places. I hope so. Um, when you said that the pulp lift is mostly a proxy to pulp installer, I just thought maybe it's time to merge those repositories into one. I think we just recently started to have a CI on pulp lift that just runs the installer. So that would be really interesting to use as the CI for the installer. That is an interesting idea. Um, the And I think it could actually work just fine uh, because uh, whenever we publish the installer as a collection we just build it out of you know then pulp installer directory and pulp lift is just a few configuration files itself uh so as far as combining them it makes total sense right now in pulp lift pulp installer lives as a sub module um and so they are already one repository and so what this would allow us to do is to combine that documentation and make um paul plift one of the ways to run the installer basically from source and i guess we could make it so then it doesn't have to even be from source and that if you want to use the published um version you could use it, but to begin with, I think it would be from source. Just so I understand the idea is to consolidate these repos. That's right. Good. That would be also beneficial because of the CI issues that we experienced today, because um, changes happen in the installer and uh, pulp lift does has its own, its own CI, which Mike um, and Daniel showed us a little bit of yesterday, which is really fantastic. But um, if there's a problem, you actually don't discover it until post-merge time, which is not when you want to be finding out problems. Yep. So this will make that better. Yeah, and the, the added benefit uh, you know, towards the documentation would be that Pulp Lift would become part of the installer documentation also. It would give us an opportunity to present it as a uh, way for users to experience pulp and i think maybe it would be easier to get contributions that way also because you would be it would be very clear how you can set up a dev environment using the installer
So talking about my perspective about that, uh, I am at the Pope team. I started to work at the Pope installer team. And it took me months to realize that when I have a problem at Pope lift, I have to look at the Pope installer. So even with me that work at the, the installer team, it took me a while to realize that. So it's not a, an easy experience for people outside the Pope team, even in the Pope team. Yep, there's a lot of pieces. <laughs> and combining them uh, will definitely simplify things. And I think it's definitely possible to say the Vagrant uh, has a dependency on the Galaxy version of the installer. So that we can even install some boxes from the Galaxy published version and some from source. And that would actually be really good for uh, troubleshooting problems that are reported against a specific release of Pulp. Hey, one piece of feedback I just wanted to mention about the installer documentation is it's written in very um, technical terms. Like I was just looking at it and it tells you how to install a plugin using the installer, how to install a plugin using pip. But it doesn't tell me like as a user, like how do I add a plugin to an existing installation? I kind of have to discern that. By developers, for developers. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's fair, really true. Speaking as one of the developers, it's still confusing. Yeah, yeah. I'm a dumb developer, so you know, um, written by confused developers for confused developers. There we go. That's perfect. Um, <laughs> this, this is the you know this kind of uh, this is part of this whole transition, and like Mel, I expect we're going to start leaning kind of hard on you as we do this. As okay, we've got the developer to developer conversation. Here's my idea of a chattier or, or more informal, hey, yeah, you want to use pulp, and, and here's the way to get it done. And pass that over to you so you can remove the remaining bits of developer to developer ease and make it um, more consumable by folk who are, who are experienced engineers, but not necessarily developers. And that's the, that's the growing the user community to non-contributors part that I'm really trying to, I'm kind of groping about how all the places we can we can approach to do that because we've got a lot of flexibility, right? We, we as a team have responded to everyone's requests. Can you make, can you make it possible to install Pulp in this particular way? And we went, sure, we can do that for this one person. That's part of what got us where we are right now. And it's great and good and we need to have all of those. But for the person who's coming in who, who just wants their problem to be solved, I want to manage content we have to simplify all those options and be more prescriptive and say, do one of these two things. And then after they say, but I have this other set of needs. Okay, now you're an advanced user. We can, we fulfill that, but now you have to go read the harder documentation. And I expect it'll take some time for us to get a flow um, in, in the docs that makes this easier. But I think this is the right path to be on. So uh, to talk about like the install strategy, like other way to go about installing a plugin. So currently, like we have this data structure for the installer called pulp install plugins. And the like individual role readmes are like man pages. If you ever look at the man page or things like said or whatever, they're not meant for people that try to learn how to use said. They're meant for people that already know how to use said, but then you look up the reference. Um if you were to write a complete tutorial on how do you like you add a plugin and you deal with the fact that like you have to pick the correct version. Like if we write some sort of like read me that, it would just be very long. And our plan was to, for the entire process of figure out, I want to add a, like adding a plugin or specifying which plugins I want to install should be, the entire process should be made easier thanks to tooling that Fabricio is working on. And then we write a nice uh, guide on how to do it. So, I think that's an excellent comparison. Um, and we don't want to <clears throat> lose the reference style that we have right now. It serves its purpose, to your point. Um, the goal of attracting a larger user base to have even more and more people use Pulp, I think, is going to motivate us to write that other guy. And long though it may be, we'll need to try to make it great somehow. 
by dividing it up into lots of sub pages, making sure there's discoverability, making sure it's search index, all the things. Right, it's like we could write the long guide right now and then once the tooling's ready, make it shorter. It would The guide yeah. would be probably another page of the uh, installer docs. Yep. Um, I, r related to that, uh, one of my general concerns with the installer is that um, while well, Ansible is great and it's quick, quickly, if not already, the dominant configuration management uh, language, it's not a language, um, technology. In the industry, uh, the problem with us, with our installer is that you have to know Ansible to some extent, even basic things, but you still have to know something about Ansible to use it. And this creates a, a binary value problem for Pulp, where in order to experience Pulp, you also have to experience Ansible. And that uh, holds us back. I think it holds back uh, users from using Pulp. Um, and uh, I don't think we want to, I'm not proposing any changes to the installer itself. It runs at Ansible. That's not going to change. That's our horse to ride. But um, I do think that options like the other, to Fabrizio's point, that we have other just as good installers like the OCI images, which you can literally just Docker start or Podman start. Um, and highlighting those perhaps a bit more, I think, can solve this binary value problem. That's yeah, one thing I'm worried about. No, I like that. I like that idea. Um, before I forget, I, Mike, I really like your your uh, comparison of the reference docs we have to man pages. Um, I think it's very apropos. And you're right, man pages are not something you go to to learn how to use a thing, but boy, are they useful. So we definitely want to keep those. Um, Brian, to, to go down your you know OCI image, if I think about some of the comments that we've had and that we've said we've all said in terms of um, being able to experiment with pulp, having that all in one image be the answer to, okay, I don't know what pulp is. Show me what pulp is. And if we had a, you know, here's everything in a container, including it's already got four of our fixtures synced. So it's already got data available there. It has zoo and a couple of other of the, the fixtures that we use. So run this, it'll be up and running in the container. And then on your command line, you can start doing these kinds of things to look at it. Feels like a way to get right to a running instance without and sidestep the entire installation process. Um, and I really like that idea of that all the, all the plugins with, with some of the amount of content. So the user who's, who just wants to take it out for a spin can do that with a very small number of uh, steps would be optimal from my point of view. I really like that idea. Yeah, I mean, I hope that we can get to the point where our single container is not just a try it out uh, mechanism, but actually something that we can uh, encourage folks to use in production. I agree. Yeah, another thing we should definitely keep on doing is uh, Look out for, be on the lookout for any tools that'll help us like wrap the installer to make it a lot easier for people to use. Um, like something that can just simply create a CLI around uh, the installer. Um, yes. Uh, so like Foreman has something like that. I'm trying to, I, I evaluated it and determined it would not make things significantly easier, only like a tiny bit easier, you know? I'm trying to figure out yes. the name of it. Obol. Yeah. Obol would not make things uh, significantly easier uh, for everybody, for our users, but it was, it does go to show that there is such a, you just possibly make, create a, like a just easy to figure out CLI for Ansible. If anybody sees any more tooling like that, please let me know. Let us know. So the Douglas, problem. what is your, uh, experience with the installer and just getting pulp deployed. So for us, the, the most beneficial part or the bit that we leveraged the most was the documentation relating to PyPy. 
Um, and the reason why I say that is we <clears throat> we use RPM internally. So we just replace the, the PyPy section with the RPM install. Um, and it gives a, a clear indication of expected services to be running on ports and um, <coughs> what needs to be installed. We didn't look at the installer at all because we're not an Ansible shop. We use Salt internally and we have no, no desire to use Ansible to, to manage our configuration. So it would need to go into Salt. Um, that being said, um, when the more nuanced configuration was required, I believe, I, I don't know who pointed me in the direction, but someone in IRC pointed me in the direction of the installer. Um, and one of the benefits of Ansible is it's, it's a fairly, I've never used it before, um, yet the configuration files are relatively easy to follow. Um, so for, for me personally, being able to review the installer um, and take certain bits out of that and, and transfer it into Salt, it, it worked reasonably well. Um, if we didn't have the original um, set of documents relating to just using PyPy, I'm not sure what we would have done. Um, I think it would have been much, much harder to get off the ground. Um, I think the image discussion is incredibly useful um, for people that just want to try it out. I'd be surprised if people were going down the pulp installer route um, to simply try it out. Um, that, that seems like the perfect solution. Um, but for someone that's looking to actually deploy infrastructure internally, um, yeah, not, not having that initial PyPy documentation would have made it painful. Cool. Yeah. Um, and that, it's been a struggle also keeping that up to date, that PyPy documentation, because that's another, you know, uh, installation path that we have to keep up to date. But I'm glad to hear that it is useful. Yeah, it, it definitely was useful. Because it, it is effectively completely independent. You can replace the, the PyPy element with building out your RPMs and, my God, dealing with the dependency tree. Um, so did you package but, all the RPMs yourself? Unfortunately. <laughs> Good job. Took a while. Oh. Yeah, I bet. It's a lot of dependencies. Yeah. Um, but that, that, that's completely replaced by the RPM process. And, and then it's just a very quick overview of these configuration files need to be set. Um, these services need to be running. Um, you need to set up the Postgres DB. The only bit I mentioned it yesterday, um, the only bit that seemed to be missing from that very high level um, was the requirement for a reverse proxy. That's not actually listed anywhere. Um, so that, that was a surprise to me when I was trying to work out why is nothing connecting to anything. And um, the, the client connection doesn't actually appear to support port configurations. Um, and certainly not. I, I remember this discussion on IRC. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, uh, I'll be back in two days and set up <laughs> HA proxy. Do you open an issue against us? Uh, I, I will do. I was thinking about it yesterday. I will do. Yes, please. Because, I mean, this is incredibly valuable insight that you're giving to me, at least, and I don't want it lost. And, you know, we don't get to all the issues right away, but if they're out there, they're searchable, and we go, oh, shit, that's the thing we have to work on next sprint. So please right. do find stuff you, like that. You, you've fixed, you guys have fixed pretty much all of the issues that I've raised, some of them coding, some of them documentation, so... Um, surprisingly quickly. Well, maybe not surprisingly quickly, but quickly. <laughs> so I'll, I'll actually introduce two more talks about the installer, then we go go back to discussion. Let me share my screen here. So 
uh, my mix open, yeah. So, yeah, I put our GitHub handles here. It was not by accident because, as I said before, it took me a while to understand that for understand pull lift, we have to go to pull installer, and I'm failing to communi that, communicate that. And I think uh, every time you see some fail, or when you see that it's pretty hard to follow some procedure on the documentation about our installers, feel free to ping us. And it's hard to, to write a good documentation because you have to think like a, a user that is seeing it for the first time and feedbacks will help a lot of us. So please uh, reach us on IRC or the mailing lists. But going back to the presentation, I think he, one of the greatest pain points we face so far is about the dependence management because each plugin can have a different requirement about pulp core. So uh, we release a pulp core today, and maybe just pulp Ansible is com compatible, but you also need pulp RPM, and it probably will break your installation. I start some third-party lib for just listen uh, list what is what versions are compatible with. Uh, the terminal pulp core version, but I think it's like a quick way to just expose it, but it's not the best way to solve the problem. And uh, I'm starting a POC about a plugin for checking the compatibility and giving some friendly error message because sometimes our installer fails and it's hard to understand that is because of the the versions compatibility yep and even though we're gonna um require that you know pulp core stay backwards compatible for two releases this is still going to be useful because the one upgrade is going to go smoothly because everything is still compatible. But then the next upgrade, there's still going to be something that's not compatible and you can't finish your upgrade. So we definitely need to make it very clear to the user what exactly the conflicts are and not just the output that PIP gives, which is really hard to read. <laughs> Um, yeah, though that uh, plugin, the Ansible plugin, will be great, and we should definitely continue work on that. Yep, this is exactly the tooling I was talking about. It's like, how do I go about installing a plugin? Well, the first thing you have to do is to determine which version of the plugins, which plugins you can install at which versions. Yep. That's more difficult than figuring out the config file syntax. Yeah, and I, th I think that's why just increasing the deprecation cycle of pulp core plugin interfaces is just so critically important. And I'm really glad that with 3.7 that's happening. And um, we should consider maybe even making it longer. We'll see. Yeah, right. I was going to say that that window really helps. But it doesn't actually it doesn't completely solve the problem. And I think longer term, we're going to need to give some thought to, okay, what do we do with with a plugin that we're not maintaining that is just kind of falling behind? Um, you know, and I'm not sure I'm not sure that there's a there's a thing to do, but it's a problem that is going to bite us at some point is um, that plugin could work because we haven't upgraded any APIs that it depends on, but because of the way it's specced, it suddenly stops being installable because nobody updated the spec file and it's not ours. This is the kind of the, the kind of problem that having community plugins is something we have to at least have thought about how to deal with um, so that we 
you know, how Fedora, for example, has a whole process for marking uh, maintainers as unresponsive and marking packages as retired and uh, because they're not being updated. Down the road a ways, we're, those are kinds of the kinds of problems that we're likely to have to start being able to deal with. And it's not an immediate problem. It may not even be a pull three problem, but soonish in the next year or two, we are absolutely going to have to think about process for marking pulp plugins as not current and not usable with the current release of pulp. Yeah, or or updating them, but fair point either way. Um, if, we can, if we can, yeah. The uh, and I agree with you that situation is especially problematic because um, it's one thing if. Uh, a single piece of software is fallen out of uh, maintenance and out of date. And because it, it is not current enough, it cannot be used. This happens all the time in software land. What doesn't happen so often in the situation we have, which is where a single user's installation is using five plugins. And because one plugin is out of date, they can no longer use the remaining four, which yeah. are perfectly good. Exactly and right. This is a really tricky situation. Exactly right. And it's a, you guys have heard me say with the vices of our virtues, the virtues of, of the architecture we have is anybody can create plugins without waiting for us to do it. And that's great. And the downside is, and if that person stops maintaining it, we're kind of stuck. And that we have to figure out how to address that. I just have one really quick last talk to, to talk about. Let me share my screen again. So the last thing I want to talk about is web server. We use white noise to, to proxy the request to Django. And right now, uh, Pulp Installer, it's supposed to be, it's conscious to we only use Pulp for it because white noise kind of takes all requests for it. So, it is not a documented thing so far that we expect to just the pulp to be only started there. So uh, I would ask the community, what about that? If you have use cases that we are using pulp alongside other web service config. And I think, yeah, that, that's the last talk that I, I want to bring. I will stop my share screen and we can talk more about it. So Fabrizio, just because I think I'm a little confused, is the problem that you're, that, that you're, you're stating here that that our current installation process makes the assumption that pulp is the only thing responding to the web server and that that doesn't match a lot of people's configuration? Yes, I don't know if it, it doesn't match a lot of people, but- Yeah, that's the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah, I see, I see. So essentially so, it's all running by itself, if you will, on, the, on a given yeah. box. Yeah, yeah. And, and part of the, um, uh, We've seen that it's a problem in practice. For example, Galaxy and G um, would like to, uh, since they offer view sets that are similar to some of the Pulp Ansible view sets, they would like to not have some of the Pulp Ansible view sets routed. But um, the way that the route structure is set up in our in our um, Nginx and Apache configs, they can't do that. Um, but also at the same time, they want to, Galaxy and G wants to host and needs to uh, host a UI at the root of the web server. That way when a user browses to what they feel is just the root of the application, um, they receive the, the UI. So we still need to be able to serve um, static assets at that location. And so it's, it's just tricky business. So that's one of the practical problems um, the other issue, and I'm going to put a link here to the issue that's kind of tracking a little bit of that, but in a minute, the other, the other issue is that, um, at least my belief is that, uh, 
it's fair and reasonable for users to want to deploy applications uh, besides pulp in the same URL namespace um, because there are um, other, like say you wanted to put, I mean, this is a silly example because I don't think, I don't, I don't use this offer anymore. I guess that's all I can really say about it. But say people wanted to put PHP my admin. Uh, well, that's my SQL, but um, the Postgres equivalent to something like that um, to be able to browse their database more directly through the web server. Pulp doesn't do that. Pulp never, I think, is going to do that. And the other applications do. And so there's a, I think there is a motivation for external tooling that works for your Pulp installation. It's not that you're just trying to cram a bunch of apps into it. So for all these reasons, the, the situation that Fabrizio is describing is tricky business, and it's also really important. Um, but not everyone may believe that we should be allowing other applications side by side pulp. But then usually this is the part of the meeting where someone points out that Catello is actually a application that runs side by side pulp, or actually That's pulp right. to itself is an application that runs side by side pulp. Yeah, exactly. And so Catello works around this by not using white noise at all, uh, and they serve the static assets using. Uh, web server config um, that serves the files from the file system. And that's great for them. I mean, it's perfect. But they've had to spend effort handcrafting that. And what they can't do is consume the value that the installer presents to them. Exactly. Uh, I completely agree with that. And I'm thinking that maybe our config needs to do the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, my, what I, what I, go ahead, Mike. I mean, my thoughts on this subject are like, I think the, the global like redirect, the global forwarding on the web server is only, it's only, I think you just think it's only needed for Galaxy and G, correct? No, yeah. because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, very soon it's not going to be. I mean, right, you know, there's a prototype for um, a UI to be served. And as soon as that occurs, it will need to be served up just like Galaxy and G's would be. Right, but at the same time, too, we could always have the UI under a folder path like uh, pulp UI, web, HCV colon slash slash web server slash pulp UI, and yeah. the, the root can optionally redirect to that, you know? We don't need... Yeah, maybe it could redirect to that. I don't know. It, maybe it could redirect to that. Um, as long as users can browse to the root, then... Yeah, right. For our purposes, we could have the redirect. We don't need to monopolize the slash namespace. Uh, a simple redirect file, whatever, would suffice, you know? But I guess I'm saying that, I mean, at that point, we're splitting hairs because we're still occupying the root namespace. We're just doing uh, so with a redirect. Yeah, but I thought, like, but even well, then, the point is that then everything else under the folder, under the root folder path, other than slash index.htm or whatever, would be, you know, would not be controlled by us. And, Yep. Well, it's complicated. I mean, what I'm getting from this is we we made there's an there's an assumption that is incorrect, which is that we own and can do whatever we want with that space. And however we solve this problem, we have to we just there's we have real world use cases. We have to make it not just possible, but relatively straightforward for pulp to share the wealth, if you will, of the the route that people are getting to at AD and 443. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's my takeaways. Basically, we just have a problem, and I'm not exactly sure what we should do about it. Um, and for example, 7471, this link in the um, in the chat, and I'll put it in the YouTube chat, too, um, is like uh, just one way that the problem shows itself. So we, we just exceeded our time box. So I would share my screen just one last time, just for closing <laughs> it. And uh, I just wanted to share this screen again. We talked about documentation. We, gi we gave an overview about our installers, and we talked about uh, the web server problem and the dependence management problem. But if you are facing other issues, please reach us. So here are our contacts. And thank you, everyone. And that's it. Very cool. Thank you, Fabrizio. And thanks thank you so much, whole, Fabrizio. Thanks to the whole installer team, by the way. I'm not 
directly involved with what you all are doing, but just watching all of the progress that has been made in the last few months, two thumbs way up. Thank you very much. It seems like we're, <laughs> it's good to hear that, that out of perspective, we're making a lot of progress in Solid. It's been a great mini team to work on. Um, and if it wasn't stated here, um, Mike is the lead of that team. And um, everyone is a really strong contributor, I feel like, on this team. Exactly. I'm impressed with how multiple people have ramped up. Right. I'm going to stop the recording now. Yep. All right.